Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for this one of a series of workshops on the new AMEB violin syllabus. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the head of publishing at AMEB. And very shortly, Karen Chan, level two consultant for the AMEB violin syllabus review project, will be workshopping, workshopping the level two, that is grade five through to certificate of performance repertoire for the new AMEB violin syllabus with a particular focus on the new violin series 10 grade books for grade five through to grade seven. As part of the violin syllabus and publications team, Caron had primary responsibility for the selection of the level two repertoire, as well as editing the works in the new grade five through to grade seven books. However, all members of the syllabus and publications committee had input into the final selection for both the books and the manual lists. So I'd like to thank the entire team. That's Julie Hewison, level one consultant, Karen Chan, level two consultant, Finton Murphy, level three consultant, and Philippa Page, principal consultant, uh, for their dedicated work on the project over the last couple of years. During this workshop, Caron will take you through each of the new grade books from grade five to grade seven. Um, if you have a copy of the books already, it's a good idea to have the books open ready as Caron will be discussing details of the pieces throughout the session. There will then be a brief discussion on grade eight and the new certificate of performance manual lists. If you have any questions throughout the course of the workshop, please feel free to type them into the chat at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our very best to answer them either during the course of the workshop, if possible, or at the end, if time permits. Finally, at the conclusion of the workshop, I'll talk a little bit about a very exciting competition that has been launched by AMEB with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our level two consultant, Karan Chan. Karan is the Chief Strings Examiner for AMEB New South Wales and has taught in tertiary and pre-tertiary programs at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. She gives masterclasses throughout Australasia and is in demand as an adjudicator and presenter. Karan has co-convened the Australian Violin Pedagogy Conference numerous times and regularly presents professional development se seminars for OSTA and the Victorian Music Teachers Association. Karan has worked extensively with violinists from beginner through to postgraduate levels and is passionate about developing students to the highest levels of performance and musical understanding. She is committed to musical outreach and regular, uh, regularly organizes performances which take music into the broader community. And as a player, Karan performs with the Opera Australia Orchestra and has been a guest musician with the Tasmanian, New Zealand and Sydney Symphony Orchestras. Karen has participated in the Starling Delay Symposium on Violin Studies at the Juilliard School, New York, and attended Mimi Zweig's seminars for violin and viola teachers at Indiana University, Bloomington. She holds bachelor and master's degrees in violin performances and studied with Alice Watton and Janet Davies in Sydney. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for uh, taking us through these books and through the repertoire of, of level two. I'm very happy to hand over to you for our level two workshop. Great, thank you, Steve. It's so lovely to be here with everyone today. I wish I could be seeing you live, but unfortunately that's not the case, but it's great to know that you're out, all out there today. Um, we're gonna dive in and meet all the repertoire in the grade five book, starting with the list A number one, which is Skater's Waltz by Mary Cohen. Um, Skater's Waltz is a lovely opportunity for students to play a study that sounds like a piece. The focus points of this study are smooth shifting between first, third, and fifth positions. Now, normally in technical work, of course, we want to hide shifts, or we want to practice shifting that can't be heard. However, in this study, Mary herself has actually indicated that we can perform some of the shifts with a light portamento. So where um, she's suggesting this is indicated on the music with lines between the fingerings. Um, and I'll show you just a little bit of the opening just to illustrate this. So where there are lines indicated on the music is a chance for your student to perform a lightly heard shift. Now I just want to give two tips to help your students shift smoothly in this study. 
Um, the first tip would be to bow really freely. Students often underestimate how much the hands influence each other when we play the violin. And by that I mean usually when the left hand is encountering something difficult, the right arm tends to seize up. So to counter that, if we bow really freely, that will in turn encourage the shifting action to be really smooth. And my second tip is to vibrate the note before the shift. The note before the shift is a note that's often neglected. Now, when we vibrate on the note before the shift, um, the action of vibrato actually helps to soften up that first joint on the finger, and that enables us, us to shift up smoothly. So those would be my top two tips for this study. The next study, list A number two, is a Dunkler study. Um, one I have taught a lot. In fact, I teach the studies from this whole book, Opus 68, a lot. Um, this is a study for mixed bowing patterns. We mix up martelé, slurring, string crossing under slurs, and string crossing in détaché. One of the lovely things about this study is that, of course, in lessons it can be played as a duet. And I think this is really wonderful for students to be able to play a little bit of chamber music in lessons. When they play with you playing the second violin part underneath, um, your students will improve their rhythm, intonation, and also the concept of the study as a piece. Uh, this study also has some runs and passage work uh, in string crossing, so it's actually a really good uh, developmental study for helping to develop concerto style playing. The next study, list A number three, is a Kaiser study. The focus of this study is the martelet stroke and a little bit of trill technique thrown in as well. I have taught this study to all of my students before and I can't um, emphasize enough how important it is to develop a good martelet stroke from this level onwards. So the key points that we're trying to develop in our martelet stroke is a resonant tone and a release of tension immediately after the attack. I'll just play you the first four bars of this Kaiser study. Now, often what I find with students is that they stop the martelé stroke with tension. And what you'll hear in the sound when this happens is you might get a little bit of crunchy sound at the end of the bow stroke or extra sounds other than the attack. In a really successful martelet, what we want to hear is a crisp attack and then a resonant body of the note. So um, what we need to encourage our students to do is to use enough bow on the martelet, to have a relaxed bow hand, and also to not stop the bow on the string with pressure. So I'll just give you a little demonstration on the A string. You can check that um, your students are not stopping the bow with pressure by lifting their bow off the string after they've finished a martelet stroke. So if you had a student just play an open A martelet, for example, um, I mean, that wasn't a good example of one that stopped with pressure, so I'll do another one. So if your students are stopping the martelet stroke with pressure, and it's actually, this is an erroneous martelet stroke, do you hear there's a kind of crunchy sound at the end? And that's obviously not the clear resonant tone that we're after. So what you can do is have your students play a stroke and then you can come along and just try and lift the bow off at the end of the stroke and that bow should feel very light. We don't want our students to be continuing to press the bow down on the string at the end of a martelet stroke. So even if you don't submit your uh, students for their exams playing this study, I would really recommend that they study it because the martelet stroke is actually, it's such a foundational stroke, of course, along with the detaché, the martelet stroke is going to form the basis for sautier, upbow staccato, and a lot of other fundamental strokes that we need at this level. So all of our students need to master the martelet stroke, the principles of tension and a resonant release. Okay, we're moving on to the list A number four. And that's the Mazas study. It's a March number nine from Etude Speciale. This study, I mean, the Mazas studies in general are really invaluable because they are all conceived in a really musical way. The focus of this study is the hooked stroke and variations on the Viotti stroke. And the principle of these is that we work on the small note 
and this yields a released tone on the long note. To um, convey the risoluto feeling and a strict march feel, um, our students will need to have sticky bow contact and catch the string with the first finger on the semiquaver so that they can um, release the long note with a resonant tone. Crisp articulation and strict rhythm is what we want throughout this whole study. Um, again, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the Kaiser study, it's really important to use enough bow to create a ringing tone in these dotted rhythms. I'm just going to play you a little bit of the opening of this Mazas study. is of course another focus point of this study. We can all imagine um, when we give our students something in a dotted rhythm pattern that goes on with the same rhythm, they tend to fall forward in the rhythm and we really want our students to be able to subdivide each, each crotchet beat into semiquavers to maintain the rhythmic integrity of that rhythm for the whole study. We don't want the rhythm to turn into a triplet feel at all. So that is a really integral study for um, a bowing that's really important to master, the hooked stroke and combinations of the Viotti stroke. Moving on to list B, which is our Baroque and classical list, there are two really lovely sonatas in this list, the Leclerc sonata and the Telemann sonatina movements. So um, from level two onwards, so from grade five onwards, it's really important that our students start to develop a sense of style. And um, some of the simple things that we can do to encourage our students to develop a sense of Baroque style are to release the sound on two note slurs, to phrase off um, elegantly at the end of phrases, some other things we can do are to start the trills from the note above and also to use vibrato with sensitivity, with an understanding that in the period um, vibrato wasn't actually used continuously as we often do today. So it was thought of more as an ornament. So in the slow movements of those sonatas and the sonatina, you can encourage your student to use vibrato in a sensitive way. The list B number two is a piece I just love so much and have talked to so many of my students. It's the Allegro Spiritoso by Senaye. Um, this is a wonderful piece for developing facility and combinations of slurred and the martelé bow stroke. I'm just going to play you a little bit of the opening and then a little bit to demonstrate some phrasing later on in the piece. So here's the opening of Allegro Spiritoso. just phrased off a little bit in the two note slurs, the ascending two note slurs at the beginning there. This just adds a little bit of lightness to the feeling of the movement and it's also in keeping with stylistic um, Baroque performance practice. So in the Baroque period um, two notes under a slur sort of denoted uh, diminuendo and when we have two notes slurred in the Baroque period the emphasis is always on the first note of the bow. Uh, one of the things that it's really important to encourage our students to do is to phrase off at the end of phrases that finish with two quavers. Um, I hear so commonly in exams um, that the last note of phrases in Baroque music gets a big whack with the bow. And that is, it's almost like a, an error in punctuation in Baroque music. So I'm just going to play you from the upbeat to bar 83. And I'll just demonstrate how we want those phrases that finish on two note slurs to really have a strong weak emphasis. So in the Baroque period as we know the frog of the bow would have been much much heavier than the tip and so this is a down bow up bow pattern and of course back then the first um, first bow of those two quavers would have sounded much 
stronger than the second. So it's really important that students don't give the last quaver of the phrase a big whack with the bow by accident. And the last piece in the list B is a lovely concerto movement by Carlo Tessarini. This isn't very well known, but it's a lovely concerto and it's important for our students to be studying a concerto at any given time because a concerto is really the test of the top of their technical and musical level. And also playing concertos helps develop a soloistic style of performance. So I highly recommend this lovely concerto by Tesarini. Moving on to our romantic list, the list C. Um, the first piece in this list is the Böhm Sarabande, which many of you who teach viola will be familiar with because this is actually also in the viola syllabus. The second piece is the lovely Fauré Sicilian. Now, the Fauré Sicilian would really suit a student who has a good understanding of tone colour because it's a little bit more in the impressionistic vein. The Fauré Sicilian is also a wonderful opportunity for students to develop a join, a vibrato that joins from note to note. Vibrato and the development of vibrato in level two is so important and I actually think it's something of a weakness in students at this level. Vibrato is actually mentioned in two of the syllabus objectives in level two, so it's really important that we understand once our students can do vibrato, we need to continue to develop that and also develop it to the point where it can be used effectively um, and stylistically in different time periods. So the 4 Sicilian is a beautiful choice. The list C number three is Tempo Diminuetto by Chrysler. This is a really fun piece that I again have taught many, many times. Um, it's very characterful and a lovely introduction to Chrysler's salon music. Um, it's a great way to work on students' coordination and shifting and detaché and um, to teach students how to capture this sort of elegant Austrian style of salon music. And then our final piece in the list C is a beautiful transcription of Tchaikovsky's piano piece, Baccarol from the Seasons. Um, again, this is a wonderful piece to help your students develop a continuous vibrato and a really deep romantic tone. In both the Chrysler and the Tchaikovsky, some um, traits of romantic music that I think it's really good to encourage our students to adopt is an understanding of rubato and expressive shifting. So one of our syllabus objectives in level two is the ability to choose and use musical techniques appropriate to the style and period of the works presented. So whilst I was mentioning in um, Baroque music that we're we're aiming for certain traits of that of stylistic performance in that period in our list B pieces. In list C pieces, we can use stylistic elements such as rubato and portamento to highlight our understanding of the language of the Romantic period. So whilst it's not specifically marked on the music in Baccarol and also in the Chrysler, um, encourage your students to experiment with expressive shifting, which is also known as portamento and is usually performed on the same finger shift. So I'll give you a little example of where we can put a little expressive shift in on the same finger from the upbeat to bar 11 of Baccarol. Moving on now to our list D. This is our post-romantic list. And the first piece in the list is two movements from Batsevich's Concertino. Batsevich is one of my favorite pedagogical compo composers. She's a wonderful Polish violinist and composer. Um, you may be familiar with her work from Polish Caprice and other studies. This uh, little Concertino is very boisterous. It's a really, has a really fun first movement. And again, the romance, the second movement is a good piece for students to develop their romantic singing tone and a joined vibrato. The list D number two is Rag for Raz, which is a fun and really accessible rag by the Australian composer Anne Carr Boyd. Um, Raz is Anne's tabby cat, so there's a lot of um, 
a lot of scope for your students to be very expressive in their interpretation here, to evoke a feline feeling. And the middle section is sort of more descriptive of Raz's um, idiosyncratic movements around the house. It has indications for portamenti as well, and quite a bit of rubato. So your students can really have fun with this piece. And the opening sounds like this. So that's rag for raz, and I think your students will really enjoy that piece. The third piece in our list D is the Gollywogs Cakewalk by Debussy. This is such a fantastic piece. Um, it will suit a student who already has very strong rhythm because of all the syncopations. And good bow control is really necessary in this piece because you're often switching between different parts of the bow and there's some bouncing strokes in there as well. Um, I think this piece would really suit a student with a mature concept of music and really good ensemble skills. There are a lot of tempo changes in this piece as there so often are in Debussy. Um, and so what will be essential to making this piece go really well is a lot of rehearsal time with the pianist. But I really love this piece and I think it's a really violinistic arrangement and I hope your students really enjoy this one. The last piece in our grade 5 book is one of the original tangos to emerge from Buenos Aires in the early 20th century. It's called El Choclo and it's by the composer Violdo. I think students will love this piece, it's just such a wonderful tango and it's a really great opportunity for you students to further develop a really deep tone with really solid bow contact and also to enjoy using rubato and expressive shifting. Um, so that is our grade five book. Moving on to our grade six book, the list A is, uh, list A number one is Take to the Hills by Mary Cohen. Another fantastic study in the form of a piece. The focus points of this study are the technique of playing fifths as well as position security and string crossing. And it's the second part of the study is sort of influenced by Irish fiddling tradition. And the study is based on the Irish real drowsy Maggie. So this piece is a lot of fun, Take to the Hills. The second study is Etude number 10 from Firillo's 36 Caprices. Um, I'll be honest, this Firillo is probably one of the more difficult studies in the list A of grade six. Um, there is really nothing better than the Ferrello studies to get your kids moving around the violin because it's just, there's so much position work in the Ferrello etudes. And I actually teach my, my own students almost every study in the Ferrello book. So I highly recommend this uh, Ferrello study. It, you can see it's also got many, many combinations of string crossing. So it's a very, very important study for developing virtuoso technique. The list A number three is one that you might not be familiar with. It's a presto by um, the wonderful Russian composer Kamarovsky. And this one develops security in the first, second and third positions, but also it's really important for developing deft changes of bow speed and bow speed in different combinations of bowings and in different parts of the bow. So I gave this to one of my students last week and I neglected to explain the bow speed to her. So it came back the next week sounding not at all like how I expected it to. So let me just show you how to explain the first, the opening bow stroke. So we want to stay in the upper half of the bow for the first seven bars. So the down bow speed needs to be exactly double the up bow speed in this opening bow pattern. So in slow motion would be like So the down bow really needs to be fast. But then um, in bar eight, we move to the um, lower half of the bow on that long slur, and we actually end up switching around the bow speed pattern. So from bar nine onwards, we want a slow bow on the down bow, and then a fast light, fast and light up bow. So the bow speed patterns switch and become opposites at the opening of the study. Uh, 
Um, and the final study in our list A is an absolutely fundamental study for detaché string crossing by Mazas. Um, in terms of string crossing, students are often so preoccupied by the string crossing that they forget to use a broad detaché. So I would really encourage your students to use a broad detaché in the study, otherwise the tone quality will lack resonance. Um, this study is also fantastic for developing coordination and shifting in, in a fast tempo. And there's a little bit of trill technique and double stop technique, and of course shifting in there as well. So this is a really fantastic fundamental study. Moving on to our Baroque and classical list, list B. Our first piece here needs no introduction. It's the Fioco Allegro that so many of you will be familiar with from the Suzuki books. So at this point might be a good time to mention that the bowings and fingerings in um, this A and B edition are just suggestions. So if you have a student, for example, who has actually learned this piece from a Suzuki edition, feel free to use the fingerings and bowings that they are more familiar with. Um, the list B number two is a sonata that we may all know as one of the Handel sonatas, but now it's thought to be um, attributed to Handel. We're not actually sure that it was written by Handel. Um, this sonata is another lovely opportunity for your student to further develop their understanding of the Baroque style. So trills beginning on the upper note, trills starting more slowly with an appoggiatura and increasing in speed throughout the trill in slow movements, releasing the sound or tapering the sound on two note slurs, having an awareness that vibrato was treated as an ornament in this period of music and also avoiding heavy shifts in our list B and C pieces. Those are some lovely things to focus on to encourage stylistic performance in, in pieces in this list. The list B number three is a really fun and upbeat presto from one of Haydn's string divertimenti. This piece is a little bit fiddly, meaning it will suit a student who has nimble left and right hand technique. The string crossings are quite fast and they include four string and three string string crossings in a fast tempo. But it's a really, really fun piece and musically very lively piece and rewarding to play. The last piece in the list B is a lovely concerto by Vivaldi. It's not one of his more well-known concertos. Um, a lovely concerto in E minor. Again, it's really important to practice um, Baroque concerti so that we can develop later on our classical and romantic concerto style. And you have the opportunity in the second movement to play around with ornamentation. Again, to show that our students have an understanding of Baroque style, it's lovely for them to be able to experiment with ornamentation in the slow movement of this Vivaldi concerto. Moving on to list C, um, our first piece is a lovely Dunkler Air Varie, so it's a theme and variations, and I can't recommend these Dunkler Air, Air Varie highly enough. I have taught them extensively, and they are fantastic pieces for teaching bow strokes and characters in a really efficient way. Um, because each variation features one specific bow technique and also each variation, of course, has its own distinct character. So they are fantastic and efficient pieces on which to teach refinement in the bow technique and not to mention their beautiful music as well. So the Dunkler Air Varie on a theme of Pacini is just a really beautiful piece that I think your students will really enjoy. The next piece um, is I just love this piece. It's Dvorak's first movement from his Sonatina in G minor. This is a wonderful piece of chamber music. And as such, my strongest recommendation for teaching this piece is to teach it from the piano part, from the very first lesson. So when I teach sonatas and sonatinas, I have the violin part on my stand, of course, and you need this for fingerings and bowings, but I also have the piano part open either on my lap or also on the stand. Um, and I encourage you to make sure that your students are also reading from the piano part with sonatas and sonatinas from the very first moment they start to learn their repertoire. Students who study the piano score always form much more highly intelligent interpretations and studying music from the full score, so um, that's the piano score for sonatas and sonatinas and of course the orchestral score or the piano score for concerti, 
studying music from the full score is such a shortcut to improving rhythm, ensemble, balance, phrasing, pulse, even intonation improves when you study music from the score because you can see what harmony your notes are part of. So one important thing to mention with this Dvorak Sonatina, even though Dvorak was himself an accomplished violinist, unfortunately a lot of his music doesn't sit that comfortably for us as violinists. Um, so to play this sonatina movement well, your student needs to be very nimble in the bow and very comfortable with a range of different bow strikes and swapping between them very quickly. And your student needs to be really comfortable in the lower half of the bow. In this piece, there are a lot of um, accents in Sforzandi, but it's really important to play the accents with uh, vibrato because we never want to lose that characteristic bohemian warmth in our sound quality. So I'll just play you the beginning, which of course is an accent on every note in the opening theme of this sonatina. But we want to encourage our students to play the accents with both bow speed and vibrato to warm up the tone. So we never want that harsh quality to come into the accented playing in this sonatina. Um, one other thing to mention is that um, many of the climaxes in the sonatina occur, well, they need to be played in the lower half of the bow, both in terms of strength of tone and articulation. So, for example, in bar 52 and in bar 50, uh, 101 onwards, this triplet pattern needs to be performed in the lower half of the bow. I can imagine that a lot of students will be stuck in the upper half of the bow at this point. That part of the bow won't work for conveying the strength and the character of this music. So in, in that pattern of bow stroke, the slurred two notes in a down bow and the separate up bow, that really needs to be performed in the lower half of the bow. Also, in the development section of this piece, um, from 102 onwards, there are some tricky moments in terms of intonation. So I highly recommend that your students practice this section, so that's the section from 102 onwards, just slowly with separate bows, only to establish the, the shifting pattern and the fingering and good intonation. And they can do that before they put the bowing pattern on those notes there. Otherwise, those eight bars from about 102 onwards are always going to suffer in terms of intonation. I just love this piece, this Dvorak Sonatina movement, and I hope that all your students have the opportunity to play it. The third piece in our list C is the lovely melody and dance. It's a transcription of two of the themes from Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. Now, the reason why I chose this piece for this list is because at this level of playing, I find our students are often more inspired by the repertoire that they encounter in symphonic music um, than their own solo pieces. And hopefully your students are members of the local youth orchestra or are in their school ensembles, and they may have even played themes from Scheherazade before. This is a wonderful and very violinistic um, arrangement of the themes from the second and third movements of Scheherazade, and also a really good chance to develop some bow strokes in the second page of this piece and also a chance to develop continue to develop a singing tone and the ability to use vibrato continuously to support the long melodic lines the list c number four is a, a salon piece by vignavsky it's one of his two mazurkas chanson polonaise um, I just want to uh, point out how to play the chords in the Maggiore middle section. So in the Vigoroso, I'll just show you the first bar of the Vigoroso here. So you'll notice that I actually didn't replay the G on the semi-quaver chord, because if you did, it would go like this. And it's a little bit too fussy to get back to the G string for that second chord. So you need not replay the lowest note of the chord on that semiquaver chord throughout this maggiore section. This polonaise is a wonderful opportunity for your students to develop a sophisticated sense of portamento and rubato that is so stylistic of Vignaski and 
first stylistic of music that was composed by virtuoso composers such as Wieniawski and Chrysler as well, and Sarasate, in fact. Um, encourage your students to use expressive rubato as they feel is appropriate and also to shift expressively, particularly on same finger shifts, as I mentioned before. So a little example of where that might be possible is from bar 81 onwards. It's, uh, it's indicated in the music by the same fingering. So the section from bar 82 onwards could sound something like this. don't shy away from those expressive shifts because it's actually a very stylistic way to perform this kind of repertoire. Now we move to our post-romantic list, the list D. The first piece in, the, in this list is by the Australian composer Mary Hill. It's a setting of the well-known Jewish prayer Avinu Malkinu and it's a very soulful piece of music really wonderful for developing really warm singing tone with good bow contact. Um, the second piece in this list is the Hubai Bolero, really fun and violinistic dance character piece. It flies around a little bit with some runs and so it also has quite a tricky section for intonation in the middle from bar 81 onwards. That would be definitely a moment for very slow and careful practice. Um, the third piece in this list is one that needs no introduction. It's The Russian Rag by Elena Katschernin. Um, I'm sure students will be instantly drawn to this work and they may already know it. Um, it's so characterful and again it's a chance to experiment with different tone colours, use of expressive shifting and rubato to evoke the feelings of nostalgia and the slight melancholy feel that's present in, the, in this music. It's also another opportunity to keep working on really deep tone and a warm, relaxed, warm sounding vibrato. The last piece in the um, grade six book is the Prelude and Gavotte by the Dutch composer Vej de Veld. Now this piece is almost in a neoclassical style, but the reason why I chose it is that Janine Janssen's first teacher, Kruger Vejen Beck, strongly recommends this piece and teaches it to a lot of her younger students. So the first movement is a really boisterous, fun opening prelude, really great for continuing to develop the spiccato stroke and detaché um, in conjunction with shifting of course, and then there's a, a lovely graceful gavotte to finish. Now we move on to our final book in um, in level two, the grade seven book. So our list A number one is another Fiorillo study, really, really fantastic for um, developing changes in bow speed and facility in the left hand. And shifting, of course, to um, between first to fifth positions. This is a study that I teach all of my students. The Kreutzer study, list A number two, is another study that focuses on martelet and also the trill technique. So those demi semi quaver patterns are, of course, the beginnings of trill technique. Something that's important to um, remember in this study is to keep a loose shoulder joint. So with that martelet stroke, we're often performing three string string crossings. And to keep the stroke resonant, this, um, and to keep the string crossings clean in this study, the right shoulder needs to be relaxed so that when we cross strings, there's no tension being held in the upper, upper part of the bow arm. A little tip for um, the martelet stroke in this study, number one, use enough bow because if we use enough bow, we're going to create a resonant tone. And of course, we're releasing the bow stroke as soon as we have played the attack. Um, something I wrote in the performance notes is to stop the bow um, on the string of the next note. So I'll just demonstrate this in the first bar. Um, so if you finish that stroke on the D string, you're not gonna get any of these sort of crunchy 
crunchy kind of sounds that we don't want at the end of the martinet. So a very efficient way to perform the martinet string crossing is to stop the martinet stroke on the string of the next note. And of course, we're not stopping the stroke with pressure because that dampens the resonance of the tone and can give us additional kind of extraneous noises that are not desirable. So this Martelet study by Kreutzer is a really, really fundamental study for students to learn. The next study is a beautiful romance that many of you will be familiar with. It's the Mazas romance from Etude Speciale, his book one. This is such an important study for bow control and for developing the ability to sustain long musical lines and also to sustain the vibrato. So encourage your students when they vibrate to almost feel that the vibrato is within the hand or within the arm. So when we add a new finger or we lift off a finger, the actual vibrato impulse doesn't stop. Also to note, there's a lot of shifting into higher positions um, in this romance. And students often need to be reminded that as we shift into higher positions, we actually make the vibrating length of the string shorter. So we need to be mindful of adjusting our contact point on the string closer to the bridge as our left hand comes higher up the string. That's to preserve a beauty of sound and a resonant tone quality. Um, and the last piece in our uh, grade seven studies list is a really beautiful piece by Mark O'Connor. He's the American fiddler. Um, and this, this music is drawn from Appalachian folk fiddling, fiddling traditions. Um, so it's a beautiful choice for the exam if your student is looking for an alternative to the usual, more traditional studies. There's double stopping throughout the whole of this study. So some of the challenges, of course, are intonation because you're always playing two notes. And then bow control is definitely a challenge because you're perpetually on two strings. So your student will need excellent bow balance with the bow always pulling two strings evenly to play this study well. I'll just play you a little snippet of the Appalachia Waltz from the upbeat to bar nine. So this is one of the themes in, in the piece. with a very well-known Handel Sonata. The, the opening movement is a beautiful aria-like slow movement. And the second movement, the Allegro, is a fantastic piece for developing bow stroke, and it's so characterful. I give this second movement to all of my students, actually, at some point, for developing their understanding of Baroque style and for putting all those fundamental techniques together. Um, and then we come to list B number two, which I want to spend a little bit of time on. It's the Haydn G major concerto first movement. This concerto is just a fundamental point in your student's repertoire because it's one of the first classical concertos that they should learn. Um, Haydn's concerti are invaluable for preparing our students for Mozart concerti. So we know that the Mozart concerti start to come in in grade eight, and of course they are in um, Amos and Elmas, or Amos rather, and it has to be said that often students approach the Mozart concerti without a sufficient musical and technical grounding to play them successfully. So I strongly recommend that people teach this Haydn G major concerto, not just because it's a beautiful piece of music, but because once your student has learnt classical style and classical technique on a Haydn concerto, they're going to be able to approach the Mozart concerti with a lot more confidence and stylistic understanding. Dorothy DeLay actually insists that, well insisted rather, that all of her students study the Haydn C major concerto. So in the same vein, I think it's, um, I think every student should actually learn this Haydn G major concerto. In terms of concerto style, um, concertos are so important for developing a sense of soloistic playing and the ability to lead and a sense of projection of sound. 
So I actually tell my students when they learn concerti that they're not just the soloist, but they have two other roles. So I say that when you're the soloist in a concerto, you are also the assistant conductor and you are also the assistant concertmaster. Because when you're playing concerti, it's so important to actually exaggerate your physical movements and your gestures so that you can be followed by your accompanist or the orchestra if you are lucky enough to perform with an orchestra. Um, and so when we're teaching our students concerti at any level, we're looking to encourage them to be more demonstrative in their gestures and in their leading and in their communication with the pianist. And um, also in terms of sound projection, the dynamic range of a concerto might be stronger than that of a sonata, for example. In this concerto, when your students are first learning it, they will probably learn it with sort of thinking in eight quavers in a bar because the rhythm is, uh, it's not difficult, but it needs a little bit of time to work out. But then what's really important when they play it in tempo is that each beat does not sound and feel the same with the same emphasis. And that um, preservation of beat hierarchy is actually a really important um, part in understanding classical and Baroque style. So when I say beat hierarchy, that's obviously just a fancy way of saying that um, not all beats in a bar are the same. And of course, the strongest beat in the bar is the first. The second strongest beat in the bar of 4-4 four four is the third. The next weakest beat in the bar is the second beat. And of course, the weakest beat of the bar is the four. But what we'll find in this concerto, because students will need to learn it slowly, of course, to begin with, is that we might find that it comes out sounding a little bit like this. Now, because I put equal emphasis on each bow, it came out sounding kind of really stilted and I didn't have this um, buoyant, happy feel in the sound. So we really need to encourage our students, once they're across the rhythm, to um, head towards the first and the third beats of each bar and to be really careful not to put false accents on half bars um, just to preserve that beat hierarchy and to preserve that feeling of classical ele elegance and lightness. So it is preferable if um, once the concerto is, the, you know, once the fundamentals of the concerto are learned, if the phrasing comes out a little bit more like this with uneven accents on the different beats. And again, um, remind your students to phrase off elegantly at the end of phrases and the easiest way to describe how to do this is to slow down the bow and that always creates a tapering effect in the sound. Other things that we can talk about um, with regards to classical style in this Haydn concerto are voicing. So you'll find um, in the figure from bar 65, we have an opportunity to show voicing. In the, um, so rather than playing from 65, rather than playing... <laughs> It's really important for students to bring out the leading voice, which of course is the upper voice. So encourage them to show that there are two voices there. And that the repeated note is not as important as the leading voice. Um, and something you may find, which I definitely, um, I, I examined a day of examinations yesterday and I definitely found this in that day of examining. Um, is that students often accent the ends of ties. This is, of course, not desirable. And just, so just listen out for that in your students playing. So they might um, play something like this. Um, and I think students do this to keep themselves in time. But of course, in terms of phrasing, it's really not desirable to give an extra bump at the end of the tie. So of course, when we play ties, we only want one impulse in the bow, and that's at the beginning of the bow stroke. Um, 
So that is the beautiful Haydn G Major Concerto, which I'm happy to say I've taught it so many times and I'm still not sick of it. So I hope that you really, really enjoy working on this concerto with your students and I hope they really enjoy the music. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful first classical concerto. Moving on to the list B number three, this is another essential building block in the development of a good violinist, this Mozart G major sonata. Again, this is a sonata that I teach to all of my students. Um, this is also going to help your students' understanding of how to play a Mozart concerto. I think definitely amongst my own students, when I ask them the kind of time period that they have the most trouble with interpreting, it's always the classical period that they find the most difficult. And this is because in classical repertoire, there's nowhere to hide. And the demands of precision on the bow technique are so high and intonation wise, um, it's very exposed. And you, it's just, you, you know, aiming for classical elegance and precision in the bow strokes. It's something that is quite hard for students to um, be on top of. Um, again, with the sonata, I would teach it from the piano part from the very first day. That way you're going to save a lot of time because you're not going to be correcting counting errors and errors of entry and ensemble. Um, so often when I hear the sonata in exams, because it's been in the manual list previously, students come in in the wrong place or they miscount their ties and that's going to be avoided if your students have learnt the sonata whilst looking at the piano score from the very beginning. Also, it's important to start rehearsing this piece for the exam early with an accompanist. Um, I often, well, I'm aware that students often rehearse with their accompanist very, very late in the piece. And um, even my own, one of my daughters actually, you know, I arranged a piano accompanist, accom accompaniment rehearsal with her last week. And she said, Mum, I'm not ready. And I was like, you can't wait till you're ready to rehearse. You just have to rehearse. And that gives you all the information that you need to go on and improve the piece. Um, so I would try and get your students to rehearse during the learning process with their pianists when they're playing um, sonatas, rather than waiting for the, for the very last minute before the exam and trying to fit them together then. I think it's more musically satisfying that um, playing with the piano accompanist is really a a part of the learning process. And the final piece in list B. That is the final piece in list B. Okay, so we move on to list C, which I, I think that every piece in this list is something that your students will love. Sorry, I'm just going to put my shoulder rest back on. So the first piece in this C is one of the Brahms Hungarian dances. It's just so full of character. Um, I think your students will really enjoy the, the gypsy feeling of this piece. The second um, two pieces in the list C are the beautiful first and second romantic pieces by Dvorak. Now don't be fooled. The first romantic piece on paper looks like nothing. It looks very simple. This is such a beautiful piece of music, but it actually requires a very sophisticated understanding of bow speed, a continuous vibrato, and a sophisticated command of expressive shifting to play it in a very stylistic way. Um, it's a really beautiful piece of music, which I recommend everybody studies. Um, the second romantic piece, which is part of the same list C number two, is a fantastic, um, vigorous Allegro Maestoso. I just want to talk quickly about how to play the chords in the opening of this work. We need to roll the chords very quickly to the E string because of course the melodic note is on the top string. So the opening chords will sound something like this. And then quickly we have to retake to the lower half of the bow to perform this stroke which is a standing spiccato. Now standing spiccato is a spiccato that obviously bounces up and down on the string, but we don't move lower in the bow. This standing spiccato is a stroke that also is found in the Brahms Hungarian dance. So in the vivo section of the Brahms Hungarian dance, 
that is also standing spiccato. Now, if your students don't feel comfortable or confident about that stroke, of course they're welcome to use an ordinary spiccato, which is just the down up bow stroke. But I think particularly in the Brahms, the standing spiccato stroke is more idiomatic of that gypsy virtuosic style. And I think if they can incorporate that stroke into the piece and also into the Dvorak, that um, will give them a more um, romantically stylistic, satisfying result. Um, this, the, going back to the Allegro Maestoso, the second movement of the Dvorak pieces, um, this piece requires really solid bow technique because it's got a lot of off the string strokes, um, off the string spiccato featuring a lot of string crossing. So I, mean, I absolutely love these two romantic pieces, but I would say in terms of maturity, they're on the higher end um, of being challenging for this list. Uh, the list C, number three, is a beautiful um, polonaise by the Polish composer Noskowski. Noskowski is not very well known in Australia, but he's very well known in Poland. And, and this polonaise is a beautiful singing work, a fantastic opportunity for development of sound and a warm vibrato and a really deep romantic tone. And the last piece in this C is um, a very beautiful and almost ethereal romance by Clara Schumann. Now I've noticed that these uh, romances by Schumann are really coming more into the consciousness of our repertoire lately. There's a lot of um, soloists have been performing and programming these romances in recitals recently. Um, this again is going to need really careful work with an accompanist because it's a, a piece of chamber music um, and for your student to play this Clara Schumann romance well they will need to have a very beautiful singing sound, the ability to join their vibrato and also a, um, a good sense of how to use rubato within this piece. Now we move on to our um, post-romantic list. So the list D number one is a wonderful piece by the Sydney-based composer Margaret Brandman. I love this piece and I'm sure that all of your students will too. It's Jukaro Rumba d'Amour. Now it doesn't sound quite as good um, without the piano accompaniment setting up the rumba feel, but I'll just play you a little bit of the opening of this piece. And it's a fantastic piece for showcasing a really warm sound, deep bow contact, um, and a really relaxed, warm sounding, rich vibrato. <laughs> beautiful singing theme and then the theme is later repeated in double stops um, when it comes back so that is a piece I'm sure your students will love. The next piece in the list D is by another Sydney composer Brendan Collins it's called Boeing 747 and it's in quite a different style from the Brandman it's in a little bit of a lighter style and it's um, a very sweet piece in a medium swing feel Again here it's a chance for your students to develop their sense of personal expression and personal connection to the music by using expressive shifting where they see fit. Um, there are a little, there's a little bit of tricky intonation in this piece because there's a lot of chromatic movement. So if you look at the music from bar 19 onwards and especially in bar 23 and bar 24, those are spots where the intonation might go a little bit haywire. So again, as in the Dvorak Sonatina in grade six, I highly recommend that your students just slow right down, practice these sections separate bows, and then mark in the tones and semitones so that they really understand um, the, the tonality of those sections and also just the finger patterns. Otherwise, we might find your students sliding around and they might lose their sense of where they are within the tonality because those sections are very chromatic. List D number three 
is a little bit more um, traditional concerto movement, again by the Russian composer Kamarovsky. Um, it's fantastic for developing the concerto style. Being a third movement, it's a little bit more virtuosic and fast. It's got little bits of upward staccato, double stops, and the theme itself is very fun. So I think the students will really enjoy playing that. And then the last piece in the Grade 7 book is Nightclub 1960 by Piazzolla. Um, this is a sort of fun, fast and furious piece. I think students will really enjoy it. But a student, for a student to play this well, they will have to have really, really nimble bow technique because a lot of the string crossing happens in a really fast tempo. Um, there's a lot of contrast within this piece because the slow movements are at polar ends of the expressive spectrum from the beginning. Now I just wanted to demonstrate the De Chiso section. So from bar 54 onwards in this piece, um, you actually have options of how your student can play it. So um, it's marked on the music sol point, but heavily on the D string close to the bridge to create an unpitched percussive effect. So your student could play it like this. <laughs> could play it chicharra. So there's a little footnote at the bottom of the page um, describing this. So chicharra is a tango technique which the word chicharra actually means cricket. So it's um, imitating the sound of a, a, a cricket, so that sort of vibrating sound. And it's a, again, it's a percussive effect. It's not meant to sound really tonal. So to achieve this effect, you can bow very heavily actually on the thread of the string behind the bridge. And um, this is the kind of effect that it might sound like. So it's not really tonal and, and you know, creating a beautiful sound is not the object of that section of the piece. It's more like a percussive effect um, that comes from tango music. And those are the three grade books. I, I really hope that your students enjoy these pieces. Um, they certainly come from a diverse range of styles and a diverse um, traditions of violin playing. And I've used my own students and even one of my children as guinea pig for all of this repertoire. And I found that students really, really love the whole range of those pieces and studies. So I really hope that your students do too. And Thanks so much for that, Karan. Um, I thought this might be a good time to stop and, and just ask any questions that have come through uh, about the gradebook specifically. Um, at the moment, only one, one question has come through. So if there's anything that you wanted to ask, please do type into the chat or the Q&A box. Uh, the buttons for those are at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, but the one question that has come through so far is on the fiocco in grade mm -hmm. six, mm -hmm. and it's about the mordants um, and whether those mordants, do those mordants start uh, from the, the pitch above like a Baroque ornament or um, do you want to talk to, to us a little bit? So yes. do you start the mordants from the upper note in the fiocco allegro as in Baroque style is the question. You know what? <laughs> Just speaking practically, I wouldn't because the tempo is so fast and students are going to struggle to coordinate the mordants with the uh, with the bowing and keep tempo anyway. So I would just start these mordants from the, the printed note, not from the note above. It's more trills that start on the note above because that's an appoggiatura um, and that emphasizes um, tension in the release and harmony in Baroque music. So with mordants, um, they typically start on the printed note. Perfect. Uh... That's all that's come through so far, but I thought it would it would be better to ask it now rather than wait till the very end. Right. Uh, so please do continue to to type in any questions that you have. Again, either using the chat or the Q and A functions at the bottom of your Zoom Zoom screen. Sorry for the interruption. Please please carry on. Okay, great. So that's the end of talking about um, grade five to seven, and so we move now to grade eight and certificate of performance. Now, there's not a lot that's different in grade eight. Um, you will find, but you may not notice that some of the more difficult studies from grade eight have moved around and have moved up to certificate of performance. 
Um, but one lovely addition to the grade eight manual lists is in list C. So I'm not sure if those of you who are watching who have your syllabus in front of you. Let me see if I can get that page open and I'll tell you what page number it's on. So the grade eight syllabus starts on page 139 of the manual of syllabuses. So in this C, I've just added a really beautiful violin transcription of the Chopin C sharp minor nocturne. This transcription is by Milstein. It's a really, um, a really beautiful piece of music and a really beautiful transcription that I've taught a lot. Um, the Chopin Nocturne. And in list D, you will also find two editions. So one is, it's the second uh, piece in the manual list. It's by the Melbourne-based composer Hugh Crosthwaite. Um, it's a solo piece called Counterpoise. This is a really beautiful and very atmospheric piece. The music for the piece is available on Hugh's website, so that website is linked in the manual of syllabuses. And also, um, helpfully, on his website, there is a beautiful recording by Sarah Kuro of this piece. So it always helps with the post-romantic repertoire, of course, if your students can hear recordings of the works um, before approaching them. Um, so I really encourage you to check out that work because it's a really beautiful piece of music. And then the other addition to the list D in grade eight is the Kamarovsky Concerto in E minor, the first movement. So this has actually moved up from the grade six manual list because it was a little bit more challenging than grade six level. Um, this Kamarovsky Concerto first movement is a piece I can't recommend highly enough. I teach it to all my students. It's a fantastic piece of music, but also really excellent for developing concerto style. So those two pieces, the Crosthwaite, Crosthwaite Counterpoise and the Kamarovsky First Movement from Concerto in E minor are two new additions to the Grade 8 List D manual list. Now we come to the Certificate of Performance and there's a big change <laughs> in this syllabus, as you might already be aware of. Um, Formerly, this syllabus was written in two lists and now it is in four lists. And this is more in keeping with the level two manual of syllabuses, uh, level three, sorry, um, the AMUS and the LMUS lists are all in four lists. And the reason for this is to assist you in creating a balanced program for your students. Now, there's a couple of points I want to mention. Um, so you will now be selecting um, a piece from each list, lists A, B, C and D for your students for their program, but we still need to be mindful that the overall program time needs to be within 25 to 35 minutes. So in Certificate of Performance, we have often had some extremely short exams um, some of which unfortunately might have been marked unable to assess on account of their length, short length. Um, so just make sure if you have chosen four pieces, um, one of each list for your students program for certificate of performance, do check that the timing of the total timing of those pieces is above 25 minutes and below 35 minutes. If it is not, and this is mentioned in the syllabus, you can draw another work from one of the lists to make up that time. But it's really important this, that this exam is not shorter than 25 minutes long. Another point to take note of is that no more than one work by any one composer may be selected. Now, you probably wouldn't have chosen two different works by the same composer anyway, but it is possible to do so within this exam because in the list A, which is unaccompanied pieces and studies, we have some road studies, and then we also have movements from the road concerto in list C. Um, so it's possible to choose two pieces by uh, road, but we're not allowed to do that. There are also pieces by the Australian composer Stuart Greenbaum in multiple lists in this exam. So just only choose one piece from any composer in the syllabus. 
Um, I'll quickly go through some of the new additions in this syllabus because I love a lot of the, well, I love all the pieces that I've put into Certi Certificate of Performance. In the list A, there's a new piece. It's a solo piece by the Australian composer Stuart Greenbaum. It's called Variations for Solo Violin. It's about halfway down the manual list. This is available through the Australian Music Centre um, and there is a recording on YouTube of it being played by Anna McMichael um, from Monash University. Um, Variations is a fantastic piece. It's a mixed metre solo piece and it's got a Balkan influence. I love it and I'm sure your students will too. Moving on to the list B, we have a lot of additions to this list, the Baroque and Classical list. I've put back into the syllabus the first movement from Bach's Concerto in E major, which has previously been in the syllabus, but for whatever reason um, was missed out from the syllabus for the past few years. So the first movement of the Bach E major concerto is obviously just uh, one of those foundational Baroque concertos that um, it's really highly recommended that your students learn this at some point. Um, there's also the beautiful Adelaide Concerto First Movement. This has previously been attributed to Mozart. It's not actually by Mozart. It's um, sort of in the start of Mozart, but it's by Casa de Su. Um, again, it's a really fantastic concerto for developing concerto style, and it's quite difficult. It does, it's quite fiddly and flies around the violin quite a lot. Then a big change to the Certificate of Performance syllabus is the inclusion of Vivaldi's Spring from the Four Seasons in the list B. Um, we just wanted to make sure that your students didn't have to wait till the Amos to play one of the Four Seasons, that are, as I know that they are just such a popular choice around this level. And we thought um, that Spring might, might be one of the more accessible Four Seasons. So Spring is now in Certificate of Performance. We also have lots of beautiful um, Mozart choices. So we have the Mozart Rondo. Um, it's a Chrysler arrangement of the Rondo from the Hafner Serenade. A really good choice if your students got very good spiccato. And then um, we have the beautiful Mozart Adagio in E as well in this list B. Uh, in list C, which is our romantic list, we have one new Chrysler piece, La Gitana, a fantastic gypsy piece. Really, really enjoy that piece. And we also have the first movement of Mendelssohn's other violin concerto, the Concerto in D minor. This is a fantastic piece um, made famous by Yehudi Menuhin in his time. Just a, a little note about this Mendelssohn D minor concerto. It's very long. So I think it's around nine minutes. So just be aware when choosing it. It's, it's a very long choice, but an excellent choice nonetheless. Um, in our list D, we have a lot of new repertoire. Um, the Barba Canzone is a beautiful singing piece. The Bartok Lasso, first movement from the Rhapsody Number no. 1, such a fantastic piece. I mean... I think our students don't quite have enough opportunity to play Bartok, and he's such a fantastic composer. Um, so I'm really happy about the addition of this work in the syllabus. There's another piece by Lily Boulanger called Da Matin du Printemps. Um, it's a beautiful piece. I really recommend your students getting a taste of Boulanger's music. She's such a fantastic composer. Um, and then I've also put in the hoedown from Rodeo, Rodeo by Aaron Copeland. Students will love this piece. Um, it's just fun with lots of fun bow strokes and very rhythmic piece. People will really, really enjoy playing the Copeland, Copeland hoedown. Um, another American composer who I've included in the list D of Certificate of Performance is Lucas Foss. He's got a really fun piece called Composer's Holiday. There's a really excellent, very fast recording of this on YouTube by Itzhak Perlman. Um, then two more new additions, three, uh, two more additions to the list D. There's a, a pairing of two pieces from Hilary Hahn's wonderful compilation in 27 pieces. So I had meant to have that book ready to show you but it's upstairs unfortunately. Um, so it's a piece, a slow and singing piece by the 
Spanish composer Raúl Tavara called Whispering, and that needs to be paired with the piece called Hillary's Hoedown, and that's by Turnage. And one of the advantages of playing these pieces from in 27 pieces is that Hillary has recorded all of these encores, of course, and they're up on YouTube. And not only has she recorded them, I think there are talks on YouTube as well about the pieces and about the conception of these pieces. So um, they are fantastic works. And a lot of the pieces from that Hilary Hahn book in 27 pieces feature in the level three syllabus as well. And one final addition, one final non-Australian addition to the list D is the Szymanowski Kurpian song. Szymanowski is a fantastic Polish composer. I really encourage all your students to have a taste of his sort of post-romantic but also impressionistic style of composition. In terms of Australian compositions, I've added three to the list D. There is a beautiful serenade by uh, Tony Doheny. Um, another work by Stuart Greenbaum called Meteor from Falling by Degrees. These pieces, I believe, Meteor certainly is available on the Australian Music Centre website. And then a fantastic piece by the Sydney-based composer Emma Greenhill, which I've taught a lot and it's great fun, is Paper Boats. It's really um, fun and rhythmic. It's actually influenced by bebop jazz. So your students will really enjoy Paper Boats. Emma has a website and I believe that recordings of Paper Boats are available to listen to on the website and the music is also available for purchase both on her website and on the Australian Music Centre website. So those are the main things to note about Certificate of Performance. Again, just a reminder to take note of the timing of your student's program and also not to select more than one work by the same composer. So Steve, I think um, I'm open to taking questions about the new syllabus now. Thank you so much, Chiron. Um, there haven't actually been any further questions raised at this stage. Uh, so this is your very last chance uh, for this. Um, one, one question that did come through that we've, we've answered um, is about whether these uh, these webinars will be available in the future. Yes, we, we absolutely intend to make each of the four webinars available. That's the one on technical work, level one, level two, and level three uh, on YouTube. Uh, Amy B will just tidy those up and have those out within the next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll let everybody know when they're out and uh, available. Um, but thank you so much, Karen, for that very illuminating uh, presentation. I, I've learned a lot. I hope everybody else has learned a lot also. Um, before we go, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, AMEB has launched a competition with our very generous competition partner, Glanville & Co. Um, you or your students could win a new Glanville Daintree D20 violin valued at $2,700. Um, also, Daddario Kaplan Strings and an AMEB Violin Series 10 book pack. Uh, now, you need to enter by answering the following. Uh, what's your favourite piece from the Series 10 Violin Grade Books? And how would a new Glanville & Co. Daintree D20 Violin help you play it at your best? Uh, you can answer in one of the following formats, either written in 100 words or less uh, with an image or in a 30 second video. You can be as creative as you like. The competition runs until March the 31st, so grab the grade books as soon as possible and start exploring. Um, one, one question that has just come through, Karan, uh, if I've still got you there, yes. uh, why have Amy B not published books for grade eight and certificate? Uh, would you like to answer that or would you like me to I'd answer like that? To answer that. I think the range of works available to our students at grade eight and certificate level is just so large that it's actually prohibitive, um, I think, to publish them as a compilation. And I think um, I think that's the reason why. And, you know, I, I understand that sheet music is expensive, but I think it would be too hard at, at grade eight and certificate of performance level to, to curate a list of only four pieces per um, period of music 
to, to make into a book. And also, to be honest, because the length of the works is just increases, binding them as a compilation of 16 separate pieces into a book, the, the book would be this tome that is not very practical to lug around. Well, this is absolutely true. In fact, in the grade seven book, we intended to include one extra work uh, and we just ended up with a book that was too large for the printers to be able to print the accompaniment, uh, the accompaniments because of the, the page extent. Uh, we couldn't print the accompaniment book and, and actually in the, the current grade seven book, we, we'd already reached the, uh, reached the limits of what we can, we can print in a standard publication uh, without going to the next level of expense in, in, in bindings and all that sort of thing. Um, so that's certainly a consideration. Also, we're, we're starting to run into very standard concert repertoire with the sort of publications people might want to have on their music shelves and, and on their music stands, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of different editions and people might choose the Henley edition or the Baron Writer edition or, or, or whatever uh, at that stand at that stage and um, that way you have a choice of which editions you'd like to purchase. I, I, I suspect also um, that in the end buying eight separate pieces of, of or, or buying four separate pieces of music might in terms of, of cost be less than than buying a full AMEB book. Um, I would say in the end also. So all of these reasons, but thank you very much for that question. Um, so the syllabus grade books and other resources are all available now via your local music shop, uh, via amyb.edu.au and via other online sheet music retailers. Um, I'd like to say thank you once again to Karan for this wonderful presentation uh, and for her beautiful playing throughout. It's so good to hear this, these pieces uh, played and, and uh, made into real, real audible music along with your commentary. Uh, it's super and a wonderful resource for people exploring the new syllabus. Um, I'd like to thank the entire violin syllabus and publications team, Philippa Page, uh, the principal consultant for the project, Julie Hewison, the level one consultant, Karen Chan, of course, uh, and Finton Murphy, the level three cons uh, consultant, as well as the sight reading composers, Loretta Finn and Nerida Ustenbrook, our typesetting and proofreading team, and the many Australian and international composers whose works make the gradebook so very good. Um, thank you once again, Karan, uh, and also to the behind the scenes AMEB team, Bernard Di Pasquale, AMEB CEO, and as well as Helena Jones, Maxine Day, and Alana Caldwell for making this workshop possible. Last but not least, uh, to everyone who has attended this workshop, either live or who is listening in later on when we put it up on YouTube or online. Uh, we're very proud of the new AMEB Violin Series 10 publications and the new syllabus, and we hope that they serve uh, the violin community as a useful and inspiring resource for years to come. Thank you once again, and goodbye. <laughs>